In this uh, scripture today that I read, uh, I was thinking about this question, uh, what was it like to be growing up with Jesus? And we read in Matthew, it says, is that not the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary and his brothers, James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas, and his sisters? Are they not all with us? Where did this man get all these things? They heard him preaching and they couldn't believe who it was, right? And so I was thinking, what if he was my brother in the natural here, right? And we know he had these brothers and sisters. What would it be like to grow up with him? So I was thinking about that. I grew up with four brothers. And the thing that immediately came to my mind was in school. Like when my brothers were older, two of them were older than me, so when I would get to that class, they'd go, "Uh uh-oh, here she, another one, right? (laughs) If the brothers before you were not not very good, then they think you're not going to be good either, right? Or the reverse. If your brother was super good, and then you got there, and they'd say, oh, good, I got another one. And then it'd be like, psych, right? (laughs) Because we all have different personalities, and we all have different things. And I was thinking that's probably what it was like for them. Think about that. Here's this brother who's kind of from a different mother, right? <laughs> Not kind of like everybody else. And I, so I'm thinking about, you know, what would it be like growing up with Jesus? And it leads us to this passage that we read this morning. It gives us a little bit of insight into this question. It says, so they were getting ready to go um, to the Feast of the Tabernacles, and that was a long, week-long celebration that they did every year, and they were getting ready to go, and so the brothers are talking to Jesus here. His brothers therefore said to him, Depart from here, go to Judea, that you and your disciples may see the works that you are doing, for no one does anything in secret while himself seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world, for even his brothers did not believe in him so here we have a situation they're getting ready to go and the brothers are telling them come on Jesus you're the one who does all these works don't you want to brag about them don't you want to do them in front of all these people that's basically what they're saying and then it said even his brothers did not believe in him again let's go back to the natural here to think was it a Joseph situation where they were a little bit jealous What is the situation where they really didn't believe? They just didn't understand. But we know that at that time there were a lot of magicians, like there are experts today, right? So there was a lot of things going, but they had seen miracles. They had seen the water into the wine. They had seen the 5,000. They had seen different things and heard about different healings. And it's interesting that it says his brothers did not believe in him at this point. And I was thinking sometimes it's your family, right? I know when I first came to the Lord, my family didn't believe it. They're like, you did? What? I remember my mom saying, oh, it's a fad. It'll go. It'll pass. It's a long fad, I'll tell you. But it's true, right? Because when we grow up with someone, we see them in a certain way, and we can't believe that they could change. And we definitely sometimes can't believe that God would use them. And it's so it's a very atypical situation here, what's happening. He's t- the brothers are encouraging him to go. But, but Jesus says, no, it's not my time to go. That's what he tells him, right? And I pulled out this scripture also in Romans that Paul is talking about. For what if some do not believe? Will their unbelief make their faithfulness of God without effect? Certainly not. Indeed, let God be true, but every man a liar. And we've talked about this before. Right? What if they don't believe? Does the unbelief make the faithfulness of God without effect? No. I love that line. I always tell people that. It doesn't matter about if we don't believe. God's still going to do what God's going to do. And God is a faithful God, isn't he? And this is what Paul was encouraging them about. And this was the scripture that we should think about when we're thinking about and talking to the people who have a hard time believing, or a situation in our life where we have a hard time believing. Well, even though I don't believe it, I know God's going to do it. It's okay. It's okay to have that attitude. And so Jesus says to them, My time has not yet come, but your time is always ready. The world cannot hate you, 
but it hates me. Why? Because I testify of it that its works are evil. You go up to this feast. I'm not going. I am not yet going up to this feast, for my time is not yet fully come. And when he had said these things to him, he remained in Galilee. So Jesus answers them and says, you guys go ahead on without me because they don't hate you like they hate me. Why do they hate him? Because he confronted them. He confronted them with reality. He said, you guys are hypocrites. He said, you're not following the law. You're doing all the things God told you not to do. And when you con confront somebody, sometimes they hate you. <laughs> True, isn't it? True. And he says to the brothers, well, they don't hate you. I wouldn't be so sure about that. Because again, sometimes just by association, it can be a problem, can it? And so he said, my time is not fully come. I'm not coming. You guys, go ahead. And the Bible says he remained in Galilee. But as we continue on, but when his brothers had gone up, when he also went up to the feast, not openly, but as it were in secret. So Jesus waited for the brothers to leave, and then he went anyway. But he went, the Bible says, in secret. Then the Jews sought him at the feast and said, Where is he? And there was much complaining among the people concerning, concerning him. Some said, He's good. Others said, No, on the contrary. He deceives the people. However, no one spoke openly of him for fear of the Jews. So Jesus says he's not going yet. Go ahead. Then they leave. Then he goes anyway, secretly. And then what happens when the brother gets when the brothers get there right away? Well, where is he? They're waiting, not for the brothers. Who were they waiting for? They were waiting for Jesus. Because some of them were going to praise him, saying he's good, and some were going to complain, saying he's not. Boy, that must have been a bummer for those guys waiting for Jesus. Here they see the brothers and they think, wow, they're coming, they're coming. No, Jesus. Well, where's Jesus? It reminds me of a story where one time my father had um, been asked to speak. And they said, well, we want your dad to come speak. I was in charge of uh, his public relations at the time, so it was my job to schedule him and things like that. And they said, well, we want your dad to speak at this, uh, uh, it was a church convention that they were having. And so I went to my dad, and he, he says, well, no. He says, I'm not going to be able to do that. And I said, oh, okay. So I went to go tell uh, the people. They were very disappointed. That I'm, I said, I'm sorry. My dad is not going to be able to speak. But it was the church I grew up in. I said, but I can speak. <laughs> and they kind of looked. And it reminds me of this. It's like they really wanted my dad, but they got me. They wanted my dad to speak for about 25 minutes, and they said he can speak whatever he wants. So when it came, they let me speak, and they said to me, you've got five minutes. We don't want you to speak more than five minutes, and here's the deal. You can't tell them you don't go to this church, and you can't tell them they need to be born again. Those are the things. Those are the rules. I'm like, oh, okay. So... There I was. It was awesome. The Lord gave me a word about how a vision had come to Paul, and they said, come to Macedonia. And I remember that word like it was yesterday, because that's, as you guys know, I'm 100% Macedonian. And I was able to talk to the people about that story and teach them that story and encourage them about our history and about our past and how the Macedonians were way, way at the beginning when it all started. They were there, and it was in that region which a lot of the events of Paul's life took place. And so even though I only had five minutes, it was amazing to me. I don't know how it was for the people because <laughs> they were kind of disappointed. But that's a great illustration of how we are guilty by association, good or bad. Now that, to me, was a good example because I was able to have an opportunity to talk to the people. Those are, all those people knew me since I was a baby. I grew up in that church. So I had that opportunity to do that that I never would have had had that not event happen. And so I look at this situation similarly. There are the brothers 
They're very disappointed that Jesus didn't came, that Jesus didn't come. And from the brother's standpoint, they're probably saying, "Here we go again. We show up and they're not happy. They only want Jesus." And so they might have been feeling bad again. Or, like me, maybe they took the opportunity to talk to them like they should have. Which leads us to a similar kind of situation in the book of Matthew. While he was, this is Jesus talking to a multitude, a big group of people. While he was still talking to the multitudes, behold... His mother and brothers stood outside seeking to speak with him. Then one said to him, Look, your mother and brothers are standing outside seeking to speak with you. But he answered and said to uh, to the one who told them, Who is my mother and who are my brothers? And then he stretched his hand towards the disciples and said, Here are my mother and brothers. For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and sister and mother and then going along with that in Luke 8 then his mother and brothers came to him and could not approach him because of the crowd this is another family dynamic scene I can just envision here we are he's talking to a whole church full of people a whole bunch of people and the brothers and the mother his family shows up And maybe it was in this verse here we say that he could not approach him because there were so many people. So maybe it was Mary. Maybe it was Mary saying, come on, we'll just go to the front. We'll tell them who we are, and they'll let us in. Do you ever do that? Truth, truth. Right? If you had the opportunity and you got a little in, you're not waiting in line. You're going to go take your little in, right? Whatever it is. So maybe it was that. Maybe it was just they couldn't believe it. They wanted to just see what was going on. Maybe they needed him for something. But his response was very unlikely. I'm sure they were not expecting that response. I'm sure they were expecting him to say, oh, yeah, it's my mom and my brothers. Bring them in. Let them sit right at the front. Give them the special honor. That's not what happened. He's like, who are my mother and my brothers? Points to his disciple and the group of people say, these are my mothers and my brothers. Those that do the will of the Father. Ooh, man. I know one of the brothers was upset about that. How would that feel? Feel like a rejection for that family? I sure would think so. What are you talking about? I'm the one that played with you and no one wanted to play with you. I'm the one that stuck by you, right? I was the one doing all that for you. Oh, I didn't let them tease you when they wanted to tease you. And now you're saying they're your brothers instead of me? I'm sure that would have been offensive, right? And sometimes I think that happens in our own life. The way that I liken it is life seasons. I think about like the pecking order. So when you first grow up and you're born, you're born into a family and most families will tell you family is everything. You stick by your family, right? You brothers, you boys stick together. You girls stick together, right? Isn't that what we're mostly taught in families? And so family becomes everything. Your brothers, you would die for your brothers and sisters. They're it. Even though you fight with them, you love them, right? Well... Now what happens? They get married. Well, you go from here to, uh, you go down a notch, right? So now it was your brothers and sisters, but now it's your spouse. And the way it's intended to be, a man shall leave his father and mother, cling to his wife, right? Bad news for the boy moms, but that's what the Bible says. And so that happens, and then what happens? And then they have kids. No, I went down another notch. My sister always says, and then they have a dog, and you go down another notch, (laughs) right? But all through your life, what happens is life keeps growing, and actually your brothers and sisters, although you still love them, your relationship changes, doesn't it? Because it needs to. Because the families all grow, and they have their own families. And now I'm at the grandchildren phase, so now they have their own grandchildren, and they're going to go with their own families. So actually, these people that were my brothers and sisters... (laughs) are still my brothers and sisters, but it's a very different dynamic. And it's similar to how our church family is as well. And that's what Jesus is speaking about. He's speaking about the brothers and sisters. The natural brothers and sisters teach us. But those spiritual brothers and sisters, that's what 
He's speaking of who is my brothers, but those who do the will of the Father. And that really helps us relate to our church family. And it helps us see who we are in relationship to each other. And it's interesting to see how he uses these words and this dynamic. And it's also a challenge for his natural brothers and his mother. Why? Because when things like this happen, you, we always have choices. Are we going to be offended? Probably they were offended. I'd be surprised if they weren't. Or are we just going to get over it and say, oh, well, maybe there's more to the story than I know. I remember one time there was this big event being held, and it was um, a, a kind of sort of a family event. And I thought, well, I'm part of the family. Surely I could get in. It's an exclusive event. And I got there to the door, and they said, sorry, you can't come in. You weren't invited. I'm like, what? I'm part of the family. What do you mean I'm not invited? And I had a choice at that point to be super offended. I wasn't super offended, just a little bit probably. But then I just moved on. And those are the circumstances in our life that we can make that choice or not. And we'll see as we go through these scriptures uh, how his mother responded. So Jesus answered and said, Surely I say to you, there is no one that has left house or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake in the Gospels who shall not receive a hundredfold now in this time. Houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the ages to come eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last will be first. This is God's promise. So as we leave those things behind in the sense of our priorities, our motivations, our offenses and those kinds of things, we receive a hundredfold. I want to receive a hundredfold, don't you? That's amazing to think about. And then he says, we receive a hundredfold with what? With persecutions. Oh, wow. Woo-hoo. Nah. With persecutions. Why is it with persecutions? Because, and I put over this, our family is our training ground. Nothing trains our hearts, our emotions, our offenses, our blessings. Nothing works better than the family. <laughs> Somebody can do something against you and you'd be like, oh, it's okay, I forgive you, right? And then your spouse does it or one of your kids does it or your family member does it. You're like, how could you do that to me? What's the matter with you? It's true. It's how we react. And all that is our training ground for what God has for us to mature us, to teach us about confrontation, to teach us about tribulation, to teach us that what do we have in our heart and who is our priority. I know growing up in my family, I mean, the family was it. I mean, my dad was my God. He was awesome. I had amazing parents. And so for me, that was my whole world. To ever be able to think anything should be above that was beyond my imagination. But I knew and we know we can never grow to be what God has for us if we stay there, right? So God took me through a process of maturity. He takes all of us through that process of maturity Saying, who's going to be your priority? What's going to be your priority? And it's a lifelong thing, isn't it? Everywhere from your schedule of where you're going to be. I remember my family used to plan things Sunday mornings. I'm like, geez, come on, guys. I don't know, is this a test? Right? Where did I go? I went to church Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. Finally, they started getting some Saturdays in there. They started planning some Sunday afternoons. <laughs> Right? If you want me to come, there are certain things. And so all through our life, God uses our family and our situations in our family and our offenses and all of our struggles and all of our good things as well that happened in our family to show us what it's like to be his child, to show us what it's like to be brothers and sisters in Christ. We know that we have passed from death to life because we have love for the brethren. He who does not love his brother abides in death. Whoever hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. 
So in thinking about this, what's the ultimate? The ultimate is that we can love our brethren no matter what. No matter what. And so as we're trained, as we're taught, God continues to allow situations in our life. Situations continue to come up. But there's something about when you get a little bit older and they come up again, I can kind of recognize them now. I'm like, hmm, I saw this with the brothers and sisters growing up. And here it's coming back, right, with the kids or the in-laws or the cousins or the whatever. You see it and you recognize it, don't you? Thank you, God, for teaching me and training me how to deal with this situation because when it comes back up in my life, I can say, no, I'm going to show love. I'm not going to fight evil with evil. I'm not going to say that little comment. I'm not going to sow discord. You know, when you tell another person that's what you're doing in the body, you're sowing that discord because now somebody else knows something they probably shouldn't know, right? Right? And so that's when you say to them, you know what? That's none of my business. I like that line. Someone told me they use that line. I said, well, what do you do if somebody's starting to tell you things and they want to gossip or they want to say that? They said, just tell them that's not my business. I said, oh, I like that. Sounds like that's none of your business. That's what it sounds like to me. That's not my business. And so we see in this, this is the ultimate. And we know this. And a lot of us are saying, why is she talking about this? I already know this. I already know this. I already know this. I'm talking about it because it's Christmas time. It's family time. It's stress out time, right? It's the time where it's all going to come out. And this year is going to be different. Because as we go forth... And whatever our daily lives entail, and we're ministering to our family members, instead of having that little offense or that little this or that little that, I like Gail's testimony. We can think of Jesus first. We can say, well, wait a minute. How can I take the strength that that family member has or the strength that that person has and minister to them about the Lord? And the one that tells you, I don't want to hear about it, Right? Or the one that says to you, oh, here they go again. That's all right. Because we know this is the time they need to hear it like never before. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and his disciple whom he loved standing by, he said to his mother, woman, behold your son. And then he said to the disciple, behold your mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her into his own home. He's at the cross. And who's there? His mom. Do you think his mom got over the previous scenario where he wouldn't even come out and acknowledge her? I think so. Something about moms. We get over it the fastest, don't we? But she did. And what I love about this is the faithfulness of Jesus. And as I was really praying about this morning and the Lord was just speaking different things, just, just tell them that I'm a faithful God. Tell them I'm going to be faithful in their families. No matter what you see in the natural, no matter what's happened in the past, no matter what we think is going to happen, in the end, God is always faithful. In the end, it always comes out the way God intended for things to happen. And I was thinking about the people I knew and relationships that I know and different things. And when you think about it, in a lifetime, we go through a lot of stuff. We go through a lot of challenges. But how many times do we hear things like deathbed confessions or relationships being restored or sicknesses bringing families together, right? Or the holidays bringing families together or whatever it is. And I look at a lot of those, and most of the time, not all the time, but most of the time when we see those situations, we see, wow, look how God used that. Sometimes things happen, and we don't know, because we're not going to know everything. But one thing that we hold on to as believers, and we hold on to it as the church, is that God is faithful in every situation and in every promise he has. I rehearse those promises over and over again. 
When my children were little, I remember Bonnie saying to me, you know what? Pray for your kids. Pray that God will give you a word for each one of your kids, and that will sustain you as you raise your children. And I did that. I did what she recommended until this day. I proclaim those words over my adult children because I know God's faithful. Amen? And then uh, he says, and then he went down with them, and he came to Nazareth, and the subject to them. But his mother kept all these things in her heart, and Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature, in favor in God and in man. This is just a glimpse of how Mary might have felt, a glimpse of what was going on inside of Mary, having Jesus as her son, knowing that I had a boy that... He's a little bit different. His brothers are a little mad at him all the time. Or his brothers, his siblings don't quite get it, right? It says he was not highly esteemed, right? He said it was despised. So here's Mary probably paying a little bit of favorites. And also remember, this is when they heard him preaching at 12 years old in the temple. And they lost him, remember? He stayed back and they, he got in trouble that day, Jesus did. But the Bible says Mary kept all these things in her heart because as a mother she knew there was something about him and she watched him grow and she watched him develop and so she was not surprised by this and a lot of times in our life we look back and we say wow I guess I see how God set all this up am I really that surprised not really I wasn't even surprised and moreover it is required in stewards that one be found faithful God is faithful, but he asks us to be faithful as well. Faithful of what God has put in our hands. Faithful of what he has spoken to us to do, to say, to react, to act, whatever it is. So there is something required on our part in God's faithfulness as well. And for our final scripture, at the end of the day, when we take all these things together, what does the Bible tell us in Psalms 37? He says, trust in the Lord and do good. We all do the best we can. Do you ever look at situations and think, oh, why is this person doing that? Why are they doing that with their family? Why are they doing this? At most people are doing the best they can with what they have and what they know. It says, dwell in the land and feed. Feed on his faithfulness. I love that. This Christmas, I'm going to be eating, eating, eating. What am I going to be eating? The faithfulness of God. I like that. I like that. Amen.